in a series during January on Sunday on the church, the dynamics of the church, the dynamics of the local church. And I'm in chapter 4. I'm looking at 42 through 47. If you have a study Bible, they probably picked up 41. So then those who have received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And so they continued devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as everyone might have need. And day by day continued with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with the people and the Lord was adding to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Something really phenomenal was occurring in Jerusalem. Something really phenomenal. Something that, that had never occurred like that ever. Ever. <laughs> you know kind of hard to say something occurs that's never occurred ever. But something has occurred within the last 54 days in Jerusalem that has changed, as Al said, the environment, the way people think and behave, Something within 40 days occurred that changed Jerusalem forever. And out of that single Christian church went forth the great declaration of evangelizing the entire world. 54 days. Think about that. Something happened within 54 days that changed it forever. That's going to be the subject matter today because what you're seeing is what occurred. You're getting live reporting from the streets of Jerusalem of what has happened within 54 days in a very short period of time. Something has occurred that is dramatic. Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit the privilege to confess sin if necessary. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitudes type sins, overt sins, mental attitudes, sins of the tongue, etc. What do I do to get back? into spiritual fellowship with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, especially in a class like this of a teaching hour. First John 1 John 1.9 says, Confess your personal sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you, and that allows the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. It is the truth of the Word of God that sets you free, not just the information. It is the truth that you're willing to have change your life the truth that you know so absolutely that you're willing to share it with other people wherever he sends you, even if it's to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he will do that. He will do that if you have the truth. He will send you to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, our Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. Thank you for each person that's come our way, both by automobile and the Internet, to study with us today. The signs of a healthy church. We'll certainly look at one. The very first church. The very first church. 
that was formed in Jerusalem. Within 54 days, it became a dynamic lighthouse to the world. We, we, we need to take a good look at that, Father. We want to be that church. It wasn't a church without conflict. It was a church on fire for God. What happened to these people within 54 days that so changed their lives that they became the light to the world of Jesus Christ? What we find today, Father, I hope will change our life, that we would be that light of Christ to the world no matter where we're sent, no matter where our feet find ourselves, whether it be at work, in the home, in the community, in the school. that we would find the dynamics of what it means to be a light for Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first couple points today will be in background. We need to have some background understanding in order to understand what our subject today is going to be about, and that's the signs of a healthy church. During the month of January, our Sunday studies will involve the transition of our church to Moody. We need to understand what a church is all about and what, what we expect that church to do when we get there. You know, we're not moving it. Our dynamics of the church is not going to be dynamic because we move. It's dynamic because we understand something about the importance of the church. I mean, location is what may not is not the dynamics. The dynamics is what the church is about. Whether the church is in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria or, or anywhere else in the world, it's the message of the church. It's the character of the people. That's the dynamics. And you'll see it today in Jerusalem. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to study the dynamics of a church. Last Sunday, we talked about qualifications of a deacon. We are, we are in the process of securing a deacon. We're picking two so that we can, the board of deacons can select one, and the other one is in escrow for us in case we, we need that other person at this point. So let me remind you, there are sheets back there. Put two names of people down. We've talked about the qualifications. You can't just pick the name of a couple people. They have to qualify. We studied last week the qualifications and the disqualifications of a deacon. And so we expect there's a basket back there. Over the next two weeks, we expect you to pray about it, write names down, and put them in that basket so at the end of the month, we can tell you who the deacons have selected out of your recommendations, okay? So that's very important to us. We need another deacon on our board, and especially in our transitional period. And so I want you, I want you to, we're, we're, we're selecting two to pick one. This Sunday, we're looking out of Acts, the second chapter, a very famous passage, uh, on 10 signs of a healthy church from Acts 2, 42 through 47, and we're going to look at it. We're going to study four points. The first part of this, though, is background. Background to this church. This is the first Christian church in the world. Right here. Acts 2. First Christian church in the world. And I hope when we get through with our study today, there will be no doubt about that. Some people say that it wasn't a church. It didn't become a church until way down into the book of Acts. It's not true. That's not true, and I hope to show you that today uh, so in a way that you will understand that. Now, here's the first point that I want in background that's important. The first Christian church came into existence 54 days after the Israelites crowd, the Israelite crowd cried, crucify him, crucify him. And the disciples of Jesus Christ deserted him. And the Roman soldiers nailed him to a cross. 54 days later, 
Jerusalem has been evangelized. And over the next course of weeks, the Christian church will take possession of Jerusalem. And they will spread from Jerusalem to Judea, Judea, and from there to Samaria, and from there to Antioch, and from Antioch to the ends of the earth. And that's all in the book of Acts. The book of Acts covers a period from about, of about 30 years. Now think about that. Something happened within 54 days that caused such a stir in the heart of a city that within 30 years, it had spread throughout the Roman Empire. 30 years. We've been here 44. 30 years. What caught fire from the first church that within 30 years had swept the Roman Empire? That's what we're going to look at. Because whatever happened in the first church can happen in any church. Now, I won't be a part of that. I hope you do. And so we're going to look at that today. You say 54 days, yeah? He's going to die on one day. He's going to be buried on three days. And on the day of his resurrection, we have what's called first fruits, holiday, Jewish holidays. And 50, day, 50 days later, you have Pentecost. And Pentecost is when this all occurs. If you read Acts, the second chapter, it's at Pentecost, the Jewish festival, a Jewish holiday. And they were all connected. All these dots, all these dots of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. That's the first, listen to me now, that's the first four of seven Messianic Jewish holidays. Four of them are going to be done when we, when we get Acts 2. The next three won't, won't occur until the second coming of Christ. That's what happened. That's exactly. The history behind it is right there. The history behind it. What happened during these 54 days where the crowd hollered, crucify him, crucified, and all the disciples of Christ had disappeared? They had deserted. And one of them, disciples, a man called Simon Peter, declared as Christ was going through trials and crucifixion, declared he didn't even know Jesus Christ. Is the guy who's preaching this fiery sermon informing the first church, Christian church of Jerusalem, that's going to sweep the world? What happened to this man? What happened to the rest of the disciples? What happened to the people that cried, crucify him, crucify him? What happened to these disciples of Christ who deserted him? What happened in those 54 days that turned their life upside down and the world with it? What happened? What happened to cause thousands of Jews who had cried, crucify him, crucify him, to become believers and followers of Jesus Christ out of Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4? I gave passages there for you to read. What happened within those 54 days? What, what was the central doctrinal message that these people got? You know what it was? Easter. You know what it was? Easter. You know what Easter is about? The resurrection of Christ. 
up from the grave. He arose. You know what the central message that caught on fire? It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was not the crucifixion. It was not the burial. It was the combination. He dies on a cross. He's buried. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. It was the message of the resurrection. Because that power that raised Christ from the dead in the power of the resurrection is the power that came at Pentecost in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives within our body. And there is the fire of evangelism. If you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit anywhere in this world, I promise you the Holy Spirit will tug at your heart to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you walk in carnality, it won't happen. But when you walk in the fire of the Holy Spirit of God, He, he takes you to Jerusalem streets. He takes you to the, to the, to the area of, of uh, Judea and Samaria and pushes you out into the uttermost parts of the earth. It is the fire of evangelism. It is the fire of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. It's the fire of it. You've got the Holy Spirit, but there's no fire in your life. There's no testimony. Listen, when I meet people, I at least have prayer with them. I try to, I try to have some, establish some spiritual relay, right? If somebody, if I run across somebody's car is broke down, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to have prayer with them about it. I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ in the midst of fixing their tire or trying to get them help. God didn't send me to fix cars. I look wherever I am for why I am. You know why I am what I am is because of Jesus Christ. That's who I am. He has so dramatically changed my life. I can't stop talking about it. Now, this is going to be hard for somebody to believe, but I'd rather talk about Jesus Christ than Alabama football. I'll tell you what happened to these people. Now, I'll tell you, when it happens to any church, that church comes on fire. It comes on fire because of the Holy Spirit's ministry in your heart. And you have a message. You have the message, and he is the messenger to get it. You have the message that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and raised from the dead. And when you believe it, the Holy Spirit takes, in, takes charge of their life and puts them on fire like he puts you on fire. And let me tell you, a few people get on fire, and you got a forest fire. And that's a good thing. What happened in these 45 days was the advent of the Holy Spirit of God at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down. That's the baptism. That, listen, there, there, people get this all confused. The baptism of the Holy... Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. One time, that's it. Now that he's in place after Acts 2, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. Christ baptizes you into the church, and the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. These Jewish people began to speak in tongues out of Isaiah 28. And it was a sign of the coming judgment upon them. And it was evidence that God had done something miraculous within 54 days that changed people's lives forever. And it was called the indwelling fire power of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit came down like fire and dwelt in them. And that fire in them spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the Roman Empire. 
swept the Roman Empire. And it wasn't just fire running around loose. It was the fire in people who were running around loose. You'll see that today. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. In a very short period of time, this happened. You know why? Because of the indwelling power ministry of the Holy Spirit in people's life who sold out to it. Just sold out to it. The Holy Spirit shouldn't have to drag you into conversation. He should have to drag you out of them. I mean, I, I hear him say to me, you've said enough, Ron. You've told them the story. Leave it alone. Because I'm willing to stay there all day long. I got nothing better to do in my life than lead somebody to Christ. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit put you into the conversation. You have to listen to him to bring you out of it. Do you know that? It's this short period of time. You know what I'm talking about? A short period of time. A short period of time. We're talking about days, days, days. When you read the first part of the book of Acts and you see the church of Jesus Christ, he talks in terms of days. Not years, days. You pay attention to that when we go through the study today. He talks about days. 3,000 people saved in a day. They were being saved daily. <laughs> you know why? Uh, because people were carrying the message. They were on fire for God. How did they get on fire? How did these disciples get on fire? The Holy Spirit came and dwelt in them and set them on fire. You know why? Because you're willing the resurrection was such a powerful message. The resurrection, the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside you. It is the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 11. Here's the second point. The key doctrine was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It occurred on the festival of first fruits. You can study all this out of Leviticus 23 if you got the time or the will. The key doctrine was the resurrection of Jesus Christ after three days of burial and just as predicted in Matthew 16, Matthew 17, and Matthew 20, he was, as he said he would, even his enemies knew that he said he would be raised on the third day. The enemies, they said, lock the tomb and put a guard on it because he said he will come out in three days, make sure nobody steals that body. And buddy, they made sure that nobody stole that body. He came out of the grave well protected. Not only that, God put two on the inside to make sure nobody could get in and steal them. The, the simple message of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit inside the body now of these believers set them on fire. The Romans so well, listen to me, the Romans understood that message so well that when they captured Christians on fire for God, they put them on a pole and set them on fire. They would take Christians, put them on a cross, and set them on fire. You know what happened? Christians kept going. Christians kept going because the Holy Spirit had set them on fire. They could not do anything but preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He 
You know that church? Hmm? You know that church? Well, if you don't know that church, it's because you're not it. Because we are the church. Come on now. If you're looking for that church, you're looking, you should look in the mirror. Because there's a church. Now you're on fire for God. Listen, do other people know you're on fire? Listen, when the Romans hung them, when the Romans hung them on a cross and set them on fire, everybody who walked by knew they were on fire. He didn't have to say, do you see me on fire? I'm on fire. He didn't have to say that. I just spoke southern there if you didn't catch that. Just in case. Listen to this passage. This, listen to this. Listen to the message that comes from, from Acts, the second chapter, out of the mouth of Peter. How 54 days later, Peter, Peter, whose mouth spoke against Christ, cannot silence it. Listen to what he says. This man, talking about Jesus Christ, delivered over by the predestined plan of foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless Roman people and put him to death, but God raised him up again. <laughs> God raised him up again and put it into the agony of death since it was impossible, and you should write in for him. I, I forgot that. Since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. Do you know what he discovered? He, he discovered he had that power. In him now. And he couldn't remain silent. He could not remain silent. I have a message to tell to the world, was Peter's on Peter's lips. I have a message to tell him. Jesus Christ, who they hung on a cross and buried, on the third day was raised from the dead, glory to God. And I have a message to tell to the world. Everybody in the world needs to get saved. Because you're under Adamic sin. Why don't we go back to our high schools and say that? Why don't we go back to our workplace and say that? How come there's no fire in us with the message of the truth of Jesus Christ? You know what the bully needs in the, in the high school? You know what the bully needs in the grammar school? You know what the bully needs in the elementary school? He needs Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that can change people's lives like yours and mine. You think there are not people out there that want to hear this message? I was one of them. I came up, I came up in the tough period, uh, unsaved in the 60s, uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. When everybody was crazy in the community. Listen, people, although they are what they they. People are how they behave. It's not what they want to be. I was one of those kids. I was so angry between the ages of 15 and 21. I couldn't stand looking at myself in the mirror. I wanted to kill them. If you'd have met me in those days, and some did, you're like, he's not a candidate. I was, I was more a candidate than probably anybody you could ever meet because I, I needed something like Christ in my life. God drug me all the way out of Michigan down here to UAB to meet a person that said to me, you need Christ, Ron Adama. You need Christ. And I, that would have been the last person I thought I needed. But I knew I, I was so empty. I was so filled with such the wrong things. And even in my soul, in my hour of thought, I knew what, what is going to happen to me. Christ changed my life. Nothing else. Christ. 
Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ brought me into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that changed my life forever. I'm in love with a person I've never met. I'm in love with a person I've never met. I love him well enough to put my life on the altar. And I've never personally met him. You figure that one out. You figure that one out. I'll tell you how you figure that one out. It's the Holy Spirit inside that brings you into a sweet, wonderful, personal relationship that you and your spirit knows is the real deal. You know it. Would you like to be a part of that church? Well, you are that church. I'd like to be a part of, part of you. I want to be a part of that kind of fire. I'm going to be that fire, whether anybody else fires with me or not. I'm going to be that fire. I'm going to be that fire. If you've known me a, a year or two, you know I'm going to be that fire. It's a personal relationship with me. It's personal. I'd encourage you to come be with this. Be part of this. We shouldn't have to be hung on a cross and set on fire for people to know we're on fire for God. Listen to this. In Acts, the second chapter, verse 41, listen to this. And that day, notice that, and that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. How about that? On that day. It didn't say over a course of 40 years, over a course of 100 years. It didn't say that. Well, this happened over a course of 20 years. It said on that day. Man, wouldn't you like to be a part of that day? See, I'd love to be part of any day where somebody got saved. It doesn't matter how many it was. But just think to be a part of the day when 3,000 people got saved. I've been on days like that. I've seen that. I've actually seen this. God put me with the Graham organization. I've seen this stuff. I've seen it. You know what it's all based on? The message of the gospel. Somebody bold enough to stand up in a public place where there could be 25,000 people so that 3,000 could get saved. And, you know, God gives you great opportunities. But listen, it, I'm as happy as one as I am a 3,000. But 3,000 on that day. On that day, on that day, aren't you glad somebody kept a record? On that day, don't you just live for that day? I do. I live for those kind of days. I live for those kind of days that somebody can be added to the church role. You know how you added to the church role? You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, you're added to the church role the day you accept Christ as your Savior. On that day, added. Now, here's the question. Added to what? Do you, you ever think about that when you read this passage? On that day, there were added about 3,000. So, added to what? See, that's the stuff I think about. When he says that, I go like, about added to what? <laughs> I'm just a curious person. I go, added to what? What were we, what we added to? What 
ledger have we got going? You know what the answer is? You, you, when, you, when I give you bold print in, a pa- in, in places, you always go to those. In, in Acts, the ninth chapter, verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the reverence of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And it, the church, continued to increase. You know, where are these people being added at church role? <laughs> They're being added on to the church. We had the 11 disciples and the 120 that was incorporated at Pentecost into the church and what was added on to that 11 and 120 is 3,000. We have the church in formation at Pentecost on the moon. They were never intended to stay in one place without evangelism going out in missionary form. Jerusalem, Acts 1 8, Acts 1 8, Acts 1 8. We're going to start in Jerusalem, then we're going to go to Judea, and we're going to go to Samaria, and then we're going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, stay. Listen. The church is mobile, it's not a building. The church is not a building. It's people. Born again people who get their head in the Word of God and the Word of God gets in their heart and their heart comes on fire through the power of the Holy Spirit to take all of this information to the highway and the hedges. The people in need. People in need. You know what the church body's for? It's for fellowship. Not for need. It's for fellowship. You know where the need for this church? You know where the need is? Outside the building. Inside the building, we're of the same minds. We're of one accord. We're into fellowship. We're into dynamics. The fire goes out to the outside world that goes out. You need to be where people are interested in what you've got to say. And when they are, you, you have a tea, you have a luncheon, you go to breakfast, right? And you talk about Jesus. You can at least get one of them if you pay for it. Right? <laughs> you know what I find one of the most interesting ministries is when you go out to breakfast. I don't There's something about that first shift. I don't know. Catch them on that first shift. I don't care where you go. I don't care where you go. You got first shifters. And I, when I take my order, I say to them, listen, I'm about to have a word of prayer over my food. Is there anything that I could pray for you over this food? Any need that you have? My, 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 my. That first shift will, ke- will tell you everything. And so I write it down, and I have prayer over it. And then I go back about a month later or two or three weeks later and I ask for that same person if, if they're available, could I sit in their section? They say yes. I sit in that same section and I say, on January the 9th I came in here for breakfast. Oh, yes, I remember you. What do you remember about me? Do you remember what I ordered? Listen, nada. You know what they remembered? 
I'm one of the rare few people that ever asked them and showed concern about their needs to pray for them. And by the way, if you're going to do that, you need to leave them a good tip. They can remember that way too. <laughs> if you're going to represent Christ, represent him well. Okay. You know who I learned that from? Gary Horton. I learned that from Gary Horton. Gary would tip people that would listen to him. He would tip people, and I thought, I'd like to be a waiter for him. <laughs> tip them well. If they don't remember anything, they'll remember you from that and the message you gave them. I'm just telling you, nobody has to do it my way. I'm just telling you one of the ways. I'm just telling you one of the ways. It's not because I'm a preacher. Please don't say that. Be, I don't do that because I'm a preacher. I do that because I'm born again, and I have a great message to tell people because Christ is raised from the dead, and the power that raised from the dead lives inside you. It can change your life dramatically. You know what happens? As Christian, we get stuck in a place because we think everything should revolve around us. Well, how's your life going? Well, I don't have anybody in my life. I don't have How's work? How's this? How's this? I go like, well, you need to get out of the yeah. <laughs> right? Well, <laughs> man, that's an old record. You need to change your records. What's wrong with you? Why is there that fire in you? Why is that? The Holy Spirit is there. How come there's no fire in you? How come there's no great message on your heart? How come you can flirt with anybody else but not the Lord? People still flirt. They still do that. I don't know. We're just grabbing clutch right now, a society. I don't know if flirting is even part anymore. They just come around and say, hey, you want to go to bed? So, I don't know. We're all, I hope you still flirt. Here's one, Acts 16.5. So the churches, now we're in plural. <laughs> By the listen. In chapter 2, we're singular church. When we get to Acts 16, we're in plurality of churches. You know why? Because of evangelism. We've gone from Jer Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and we're moving to the uttermost part. By the time we get to Acts 16, we got churches. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith, the Christian faith, and were increasing in number daily. I mean, you've got to have people out there daily doing something. Right? The church is people out there doing stuff and daily stuff. Daily stuff. I was thinking about road rage. And so I got an idea. I got an idea about that because if you're too long at the light early in the morning, people will give you the finger. I can understand road rage. And you go like, oh, yeah? Why do we even learn those? those? I can speak. How come I'm in sign language? How can I get mad over sign language when I'm, I, I, I speak? And so I got, I got, to, I got to understand it. Okay, road rage. I'm, I'm going to give you Jesus version of it. So I started carrying my Bible in my front seat. So when I, that I, you know, sometimes I get in prayer or something, and everybody's peeping the horn. Then when they pull around me, they let me know why they're late for work. And so I show them my Bible. I go, I love you. No sense getting mad. No sense giving it back to them. Why would I play that foolishness? Love ya. You don't have to shoot me. Don't have to shoot me. The ten signs of a healthy church, as described here, are identified by the imperfect tense. Therefore, there are ten signs to a healthy church that are 
outlined by Luke. He's the writer of Acts. Luke introduces a series by the use of an imperfect tense in the Greek language. One of the things you need to realize about a perfect tense, there's a perfect tense, there's an imperfect tense, and there's a plue perfect tense in the Greek language. Makes it kind of a unique idea. For example, and so I listed them for you. We've talked about this before, but I listed them for you to give you an idea of how they work because it's important to this passage. A perfect tense refers to a completed action in the past with, res with uh, completed results in the present. That's a perfect tense. An imperfect tense refers to incompleted action of the past, which is continuous, continuing into the present. So you're looking for something to complete it. You're looking for something. It's something that got started in the past and is continuing looking for it to become fulfilled. Imperfect tense. The imperfect tense. And that's really a key to understand this passage. In other words, the imperfect tense used in the Greek language is a spotlight on a, spe uh, on a specific flow of something in biblical history. You always pay attention to that. Imperfect tense. Incompleted action in the past. Or, and that action, incompleted action, remains continuance until there is an identity for its completion. Okay? Now, the Christian church that we've been looking at uh, in Acts 2, that first Christian church, that uh, came into uh, identity at Pentecost in 30 AD, the Jewish festival, in Jerusalem. It was intended, now here's the imperfect tense, why? Well, this is something that has started when Luke wrote. This had already started, it started in 30 AD at Pentecost. The ch this is where the church began. And it's in a constant flow, incompleted action, with a constant flow throughout biblical history until what? When, when's that going to get completed? Rapture. See that? That's why the imperfect tense is used. The church that began at Pentecost is in a continuance of operation. The local church in Jerusalem is going to be churches in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Here we are in Roebuck about to go to Moody. We're in this process, this continuum process, until what? The rapture of the church. That's the imperfect tense. That's why the imperfect tense is used. And so you pay, you pay attention to the dynamics of what is discussed about the first church, which is in Acts 2 in discussion. Acts 2, actually, you have the, the Christian church in Jerusalem that's on the move now. The church is going from Jerusalem to Judea. Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And, to, you, and the book of Acts, you pay attention to it until you get to um, chapter 11. In chapter 11, he, there's going to be an introduction to the Gentile church where they take the... In other words, look, in, the, in Acts 2, up through, up through 10, you have a church in Jerusalem that's mostly Jewish with Gentiles coming on a board in small numbers. The large numbers are Jewish converts. Do you understand that? Because they still had an opinion about Gentiles. We get over to, in chapter 11, there's going to be a flip. Jesus forecasted and said it would, you know, it would be taken from the Jewish and be given to the Gentiles. Remember that? Didn't say in those words, but that was the understanding. Well, in chapter 11, we got... Now, what happens in chapter 11, 12, and 13 is Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. The Gentile church becomes the dominant force, and Jews are added to it. If you study from 13 to the end of the book of Acts, you've got the Gentile church is dominant, and Jews are being added to it. In, in from 2 to 10, it's the Jewish church, and Gentiles are being added to it. Do you understand the difference? 
See, this is the flow of the church in human history. See, book of Acts gives us 30 years. We believe that the period of the book of Acts is 30 to 60, somewhere late in the 60s, because in 70 AD, Israel is going to fall to Rome, and, and it's going to be a terrible thing in, in Jerusalem and Judea. But, so, what the, what the writer's doing, what, what Luke, um, a really scholar, the next guy to Paul, as far as, far as a scholar of the language and theology, especially the language, is Luke. The book of Luke is a very difficult book to exegete. It's a very difficult book. You've got to really, really be on top of your game. He's really good in the Greek language. He, he really understood it like Paul did. Paul understood the Greek language from the theology standpoint of the Septuagint. Luke understood it from the classical Greek. You'll see a lot of classical Greek in Luke. Well, anyhow, yeah, that's just a sidebar. So uh, when you get come to the pluperfect, it refers to complete action in the past. It results, it, the completed action results in the past. That's really important to understand a pluperfect. You don't see the pluperfect a lot, but every once in a while when you see it, you want to remember that. We don't see it here. We, all we see in this one, it's loaded up with imperfects. There are 10 of them. Luke's 10 signs of a healthy church are introduced uh, by the imperfect, by an imperfect periphrastic. Now, let me show you. I don't want to get you caught up with a lot, but back when I was in school, we called this, we called it is something like, like this one here. It says, they were continually devoting themselves. This is uh, Acts 2.42. And they were continually devoting themselves. We call that an imperfect periphrastic. When I was in school, we called it helping verbs. We call, I don't know what they call them now. I don't know if they even call them. But that's what we call them. Um, but, a, 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 an, but, but this is an imperfect paraphrastic, and here's what it does. Verse 42 introduces, off of, uh, and gives you the first one and tells you there's a series of them. That, I don't know, I know, nobody's crazy as I am, I know that. For some reason in my heart, I think this is important to you. Uh, that's, how, that's how nuts I am. The, imp the imperfect paraphrastic, which is translated, and they were continually devoting themselves is used as a paraphrastic to introduce a series of important things. Now here they are. Here's what, here's what we're talking about. Here's what we're talking about. The formation of the first local Christian church, primarily Jewish, adding a few Gentiles, in a specific community called Jerusalem, you know, like Acts 1.8. It was the first in the transition from the Jewish age, Old Covenant, to the church age, New Covenant, and to the Jewish nation about to go under the fifth cycle. All of that's carried in the imperfect paraphrastic. In other words, it requires me as a student of the word to give you historical background where I spent a whole hour on it. I spent a whole hour on it because a, an imperfect paraphrastic requires it of me. Because it is something that started and is going to stream throughout biblical history to the, until the rapture of the church. I mean, think of where we are in that stream of water 2,000 years out. Okay. Now, point number four is the ten signs. Now, what I did, I want you to, I want you to do this on your paper. We, have you got a pencil? There should be one in the pew if you didn't bring one. Now, this is going to be important because I want you to see five parts to it. There's five parts to this. So in, in, with a pencil, I want you to be sure the first part is one and two. See one and two under point four? That's one part. Then the second part is verse three, 
the, where it says the third sign, that's, that's a part. Then four, five, six, seven, and eight are the third part. Ver, uh, point nine, what, what is nine or the ninth sign is the fourth part, and the tenth sign is the fifth part. Do you have that? Or I want you to be sure you get, you get it because all, all ten of these are imperfects, but they're, 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 I wanted you to be able to see them in sections of ministry. You got it? So there are ten signs. Here's sign one and sign two. The first sign is in 4243A where our paraphrastic was used, the imperfect paraphrastic. They were continually devoting themselves. Watch this. Watch four things. This is congregational worship of a church. Here's the four things of congregational worship. When we assemble, this is stuff we assembled for. One, apostles' teaching, the t categorical teaching of the Word of God under new, co new covenant teaching, apostolic teaching, to fellowship, that's what we did at halftime, and to the breaking of bread, we call that communion, uh, 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 you know, communion, Lord's Supper, that, that type of thing, and then to prayer. These are the four key elements of congregational worship, of the organized church when they assemble. Well, what are the things that should occur? Here are the things, here are the four foundational principles of a healthy church. Good apostolic teaching means teaching new covenant teachings. Right? So you have that, you have fellowship, you have Eucharist, and you have prayer. And th that's the foundation. That's congregational worship. So that's second chapter 42 and 43. Notice that the second point of the imperfect, uses the second point, talking about that congregational foundation of worship, says, and everyone kept, that's the imperfect tense, and everyone kept, get on my, imperfect tense, watch this now, because this is really tricky stuff right here. Everyone kept, imperfect tense, uh, feeling a sense of awe. Now here's what's interesting. There are two Greek words here. Suke, which is the word for soul, and the word phobos, which is the word for fear or reverence. Phobos, like phobio, phobos. Almost always translated in the English as fear. Contextually, you have to pay attention because sometimes it refers to uh, a feeling of reverent awe. Do you hear me? So how it's used here. When you have these four main structures of congregational worship, where the word of God is properly and, structure, and structurally given, it produces within the congregation a feeling of a sense of reverent awe to God. Now look, that group of people could meet under a bridge. They could meet in a park. They could meet in a house. They could meet in a civic center. They could meet in a morgue. I'd met, we, I had Bible studies in morgues. I know. You could talk a lot about death there, boy. And my point is this. It's the body of Christ, isn't it, that assembles, that you, and you can do all these Right? You can teach the Word of God. You can teach New Covenant categorical doctrine in such a way that it develops spiritual growth and maturity and, and, and um, a sense of proper place for ministry in your life. 
mean, think of your spiritual gift and how important. Listen to me. Everybody, everybody in here has a spiritual gift. Do you have any idea how important that is to other people in this church? I tell you when you know it. It's when you know how important my gift is to you. Is how important your gift is to us. Sylvia Dennis. My beloved Sylvia Dennis. Because of a body, being connected to a body of Christ, knowing what her ministry gift was, could send me notes. Unbeknowing to her what was going in my life. You just don't know your gifts influence on other people. Yeah. Sometimes your gift is quietly maneuvering among the body of Christ. And always shows up at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. But how does that work? The Holy Spirit of God knows the needs and knows your gift and just does this stuff in the most amazing ways. And when that happens, you have this second rule of a healthy church. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe of the importance of their existence in the church and the importance of the church existence in the world and in the community in which they live. I'm going to tell you, when that clicks inside your soul, that's a happy day. That's better than a happy meal. That's a happy day. You're gifted in this church. And you let your gift I'll tell you, there's some ladies in this church that minister to my wife in most the most unbelievable ways. <clears throat> in the most unbelievable ways. And you know, I know they don't know what's going on. God, the Holy Spirit tugs their heart and says, write Jane a note. Give her a call. And uh, the effect it has is just amazing. You know, it's just, it's just amazing. Now, you know that, don't you? See, a church that's healthy, they come to church for all the right reasons. They come to church to grow in the word of God and become stable in their relationship with God and grow in that relationship. They fellowship with one another and the gifts work in the most magical, mysterious, wonderful ways. They do the Eucharist as a reminder that Christ has paid the price for everything going in in our life. And this life that we have is only temporary and time-oriented and is not the big deal as we think it is. It's where we're going on this journey. We assemble for prayer. You know, our gentlemen, they assemble every two times a month for prayer. It's amazing to me. I don't know how we ever existed as church without this hour of prayer that we have. And on, on we, what we used to do on Tuesday night, we now do on Wednesday night. We do our Tuesday night stu- uh, Bible study, and we do prayer afterwards. I mean, buddy, we peel the paint off the wall. This is the most amazing thing. And I, now I have people call me from other places and say, I know you assemble. I know your men assemble every second and fourth Saturday. Would you be sure to pray for this? Or they'll call me and say, I know you assemble on Tuesday nights or, or sometime during the week for special prayer. Uh, yeah, would you, would you pray for us? 
Horton is all over the, the United States and sends us a prayers from all over. And we take all that really dead serious. Uh, Rick comes off from uh, trips out of God only knows where he goes. Man, he goes to places I didn't even know he existed. And uh, comes back with, with, with needs of prayer. Man, you know all this. But the, here are the first two, and they're in the imperfect tense. This stuff should continue until the time of Christ returns. And you know what's wonderful about this? In the, the Jewish church has started here. Those who got saved by the grace of God through chapters 2, through, 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 up through chapter 11, up to chapter 11, you know, where you go through the, all the, the meanness of Saul of Tarsus as attacking the church and everything, right? Ter when the seventh falls at the end of the book of Acts and the, and the fifth cycle falls upon the Israel, you know, you, know who've, you know who've been rescued from that? You know, do you know the Jews that have been rescued from going under the fifth cycle? Do you know who they were? There were those who got saved and heard the Spirit of God say, leave Jerusalem, flee. And they fled. They went missionaries to every place in the world because they knew that Israel was going to fall to the fifth cycle of discipline. They all knew it. And the Holy Spirit of God over the next 40 years from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. got him, got him equipped, got him evangelized, and sent him across the world as evangelists, missionaries. Isn't God good? Every one of those who got converted that had the volitional sense to grow in the word of God through apostolic teaching what didn't go under the fifth to Israel. You can read about it in chapters 8 and 9 of Acts. Just, it's just wonderful stuff. The third thing was apostolic wonders and signs. The third one in the early church and many wonders Wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. I mean, miracles, all kinds of things were going on in Israel uh, that were continued for 40 years until Israel fell. Wonders and signs, miracles, we call them wonders and signs. They were miraculous stuff going on. I mean, God was trying to carve out a church. He was trying to pull people in, both Jew and Gentile. I mean, God is so wonderful. Listen, if there's one person in the whole world you ought to listen about coming events, it's God. <laughs> coming events. Then, and so the apostolic wonders and signs of the early church. And then in, in the, fourth, the fourth sign, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, is congregation. The congregation goes under persecution and how the church aids and assists those who are being persecuted. You cannot imagine the terrible persecution these people made. Listen, everything that's discussed, listen to this, verse 44, and all who had believed were together. They had all things in common. This is not communism and this is not welfare we're talking about. This is, they had not, the reason they were forced to have everything in common is they were being persecuted. By the time you get to the third and fourth chapter of Acts, they're being drugged into jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the time you get to chapter 7, they're killing them. They're killing Christians preaching the gospel of Christ. And 8, Paul is out to get them no matter where they are. He's tracking them down out of Judea, Samaria, and to uttermost parts of the earth. When God stops them on the road to Damascus in chapter 9 of Acts. And so what was the church doing under the people? They were losing jobs. Their houses were taken from them, their possessions. It, it was much like the Nazis did. And the church... The church assembled and they gave them aid and support. And all those who believed were together. They had all things in common. They began selling their properties and possessions. Why? For these people, 
They had, they, everything they had was taken from them. They couldn't get jobs. And they weren't strong enough, they weren't strong enough to be sent out of the area. They, it took a, a more of this kind of stuff in order for them to understand this is persecution. I am going to drop the fifth on these people and you've got to get out of here. It took a while, and the church, this is why the church supported them. They sold their properties. They gave things away before the government could take them anyhow. And they supported the daily needs of the people. Acts 6, we have deacons brought in, and they're in charge of taking care of all these people, the common meals and the common stuff. The, the, they're not paying their rent. These people don't have a house. They're not, they don't have jobs. They, don't, they can't get jobs. They're being persecuted. This passage is so misused. It's not social welfare. This is not what the church's job is. The job is to evangelize, teach. And listen, what, what is the responsibility of the church? This is what he told you in 42. When we assemble, teach them the truth of the word of God. Prepare their life for adversity. Keep them together. The word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is what keeps us in common stride together. Of one mind, one heartbeat. Feeling the sense of awe of of our unity of one. They were sharing them with all as, watch, verse 45, as anyone might have what? Need. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about James 2, 14 and 15. He's talking about the daily need. James, he's talking about James. James is written in the 40s. Right in the midst of this. He's talking about people who don't have the proper clothing for the bad weather and can't get it. He's talking about daily food. He's not talking about a month's rent. He's talking about daily food. We just, we've just studied this in James' the second chapter, which is my Wednesday night study. He's talking about daily stuff. And then the ninth sign of a healthy congregation is community ministry. Listen to this. And day by day continue with one mind. Where? Watch this. Where? In the temple. They're going to continue to do that until the temple is taken out. Because they, listen, as much as they're being taught, they've got so much to unlearn. They've been so law-oriented that they've got to be able to give up the law in order to embrace grace. And they're struggling. We know it from book, the book of James. This poor man was really struggling with this. They were one day, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. You know why? Because they had none. Whoever still had a house and whoever still had a way to provide some meals and out of the weather, they were being packed in. You want a comparison to what they were going through? These hurricanes that just went through Florida. This tore the community completely apart, didn't they? I just went through Panama City and some places, I mean, you wouldn't even recognize them. It changed the landscape. What do people do? Well, if they, if they can leave and got relatives someplace, they go there. If not, they hunker down. Everybody gets together, don't they? They try to make it work. This is what was happening to the church. They were under enormous persecution, just like, just like the Germans did with the Jews. Day by day, they're in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, taking their meals together. I love this. With gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with the people. And finally, congregational membership. I get criticized all the time for our membership. You know what our membership drive is? Come to church. That's it. That's it. Come to church. I'll be here such and such a day. Come on down. I'll teach you. 
All of our Tuesday night Bible studies now are not in this church location. They're in Moody at Alan Rhonda's house on Tuesday nights at 6.30, 7.30, and we've got room. They, they've great, great space there. So I encourage you to come to our Tuesday night Bible study. We're in the life of Joseph out of Je Genesis 37. It would be a great study for you, I tell you. And here's what our tenth sign was. Watch this now. And the Lord was adding. I get great pleasure out of t talking to a lot of guys I went to, went to school with in my seminary teaching. By the way, I'm the only guy that's still on my feet in the pulpit. Everybody else has had the good sense to retire. I can't. And they always ask me a simple question. How many do you have going? I'll say, I got the most unique church in the whole wide world. Every time we open the doors and every time we meet, I have 100 attendance. They said, no way. I said, oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Every time we meet, I have 100% attendance. See, I bought into that system. I have 100%. Well, I've never heard a church that every time you meet, how many times do you meet? I mean, we meet every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. Do you have 100% of your congregation? Absolutely. In all the years, nobody's ever asked me how I did it. Isn't that funny? I mean, they think I'm a liar, I guess. They just assume that, I guess. <laughs> Nobody. And I've done this for years. I tell them the same thing. I, I, and they still ask me, well, how are you doing now, Ron? It's just like we always have. I, I got the greatest church in the whole wide world. Still 100%, huh? <laughs> you know that laugh that tells you, I don't believe you. You're lying to me. And the Lord was adding to their numbers what? Daily. Don't you love that? He's always on the job. Whether you are or not, I am, well, it doesn't matter. The Lord keeps adding to the church daily. I believe that. You need to read Habakkuk, the second chapter, first four verses. And if you get your hands on a, on a, a TLB Bible, right, John? It, it says it in the most wonderful English vernacular. John showed me that passage. It was just lights out. It was sure my move along with my congregation to Moody. If you want to read a passage that's got Moody written all over it, you read Habakkuk, the second chapter out of the TLB. If you want to know how you get a TLB, why? It's a toast, lettuce, and no, I don't know. Bacon, somewhere in there, a little bacon. But ask John. Father, we're so thankful today for these who have come our way to study with us by automobile, by internet. I pray they would stay current. If you're on the internet, I pray they would stay current with us on a, on pick out a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Sunday. Stay with me a year. Don't flop in and flop around. Stay with me a year. And you'll see God do marvelous things through the teaching of the Word of God. And so, Father, I pray that. I pray, Father, for unity. They had all things in common. I pray that we be that, that we, we care about people's needs, their truly daily needs, not wants. They're in the essential needs of daily living, medicine, to keep them alive, things of that nature. These are the things, Father, the church should be about. And we've looked at 10 signs of a healthy church, and I pray, Father, we would pay attention to that because... We are the church. We are the people. And so encourage your hearts by it. In Jesus' name, amen.